Hey guys, welcome back to the D-Res podcast on Clownfish TV. This is Neon and we've got a couple of very special guests with us today. First off, I want to introduce or reintroduce you to Michael Hovermail from Graph Paper Architect, who is going Hello. to be my, my co-pilot for this episode as we talk to Mr. Mark Kern. Uh, formerly of Blizzard, and uh, he is all over the internet. We're going to talk about a lot of a lot of uh, internet and gaming related topics. Um, so, Mr. Hovermail, introduce yourself, and then we'll introduce our special guest, Mr. Kern. Oh, thank you, Neon. As so, I am Michael Hovermail, also known as a Graph Paper Architect. That's my business online as a life coach and D and D coach and. A myriad of other things game designer as well i uh, am enjoying that i have a long history in the gaming industry dating all the way back to bbs studios everquest uh, ultima online uh, meridian 59 been doing that a long time broadcast television studios and everything like that but uh, i'm enjoying being creative that's but that's the niche i want to fill we need to fill the hole that uh, jim henson left and mr rogers left when they left so that's Kind of where I'm going. That's me in a small, teeny tiny nutshell. And uh, oh. I'm happy to be here. Love working with you, Neon, anytime I get a chance to. Awesome. Well, thank you for thank you for being here. So we've got you here because you're a geek and you're geeking yeah. out about you're geeking out about uh talking to Mr. Mark Kern, who Oh my goodness. Holy cow, yeah. Cause I also, mean I, yeah, I was there. I was there when Leroy, I was there when we were watching Oxhorn videos and we still watch Oxhorn stuff during uh, you know, and I was there when when these things happened, when we opened the gate and when we did a lot of stuff. So getting to speak to you, Mr. Kern, is is a pleasure and an honor, and I appreciate it. So I'm looking forward to picking your brain on stuff. All right, so here is the man of the hour, or the two hours, or however long this this podcast uh, winds up running, Mr. Mark Kern. Say hello, Mr. Kern. Hi, everybody. Uh, Grum's here, also known as Mark Kern, although I tend, to tour, tend towards my 2D avatar more these days as it's kind of become my brand. So, um, uh, yeah, um, longtime industry veteran, you know, worked in video games since the, the early days when Bungie was selling their software out of Ziploc bags at Macworld Expo. <laughs> Uh, all the that. way to yep. you know modern AAA games and uh, you know uh, and been a been very fortunate to be part of a lot of games that are in gamers' memories and have, have changed the industry. Okay, now Mark, w would you like us to refer to you as Grums throughout the yeah. podcast? Yeah, that'd be okay. great, please. All right, all right, Grums. Uh, so why don't you tell folks who aren't familiar uh, about you know your how you got your start in the video game industry? Oh, I've always. I've always been interested in video games. So even, um, you know, uh, when I was growing up, I, w I was begging my parents for a computer and they, uh, they wouldn't give me one. So I built my own. Um, I lived in, I grew up overseas in Taiwan. I'm, you know, my mother's Chinese and I went and they had, you know, it, t Taiwan, China, you know, all famous for like cheap electronics and cloning parts and things like this. So they had clones of Apple II computers and that you could buy as parts. I bought a motherboard, which had no chips on it. I bought all the chips and my friend did too. And we spent all summer building our own Apple II, soldering these chips on the board, putting it all together uh, and, and firing it up. So finally I had a computer, uh, you know, and, and the first thing I did was I started playing games. Uh, and I was playing Load Runner by Broderbund, and then I, and then I wanted to write them. And so I taught myself programming, I taught myself assembly language, and I did more and more and more. And, um, and my parents were very unhappy with that. So, uh, you know, they were like, you should get a career, everything else. Uh, if you spent more time on homework uh, than you did the computer, you'd actually be doing okay in school. And uh, I was like, okay, I'll try. And uh, I got to college uh, and I was still, you know, very interested in games during that whole time. I was trying to make more games, make my own games. And uh, eventually, um, you know, I decided, okay, I better go to law school because that's gonna please the parents, right? and went into law school but was continuing to code games and finally a friend of mine who i was coding games with called me up and said hey uh interplay wants to publish our game <laughs> so i was like what <laughs> okay. and he's like yeah i need you to drop what you're doing in law school and code up this game with me and i'm like and and do some art for it too and i'm like oh you're crazy i can't do that i'm in the first year of law school um but you know 
he flew down to convince me. And I, I decided to take my summer and devote it to that, to, to doing a, a video game with him. And we were working on this game. It was called Star Reach. And it came in this really funky crown-shaped box. Because at that time, to stand out on retail shelves, mm-hmm. all the, uh, the, the game uh, publishers were thinking, we got to make crazy boxes. And so mm-hmm. this would look like a, a – it was supposed to look like a spaceship, but it ended up looking more like a Burger King paper crown. And – it sat on the shelves and they it wouldn't stack because it was three dimensional and it was, uh, uh, but it was a precursor to RTS games, and that did uh, that did uh, decently well for them, for Interplay. And then I decided, hey, maybe this game thing's important. And so I looked around for a part time job in law school, and that's when I hooked up with Naughty Dog, and I worked with Naughty Dog founders Jason and Andy. Uh, Jason's with Oculus now, and um, and Andy's retired doing his own thing. And uh, I worked on, oh gosh, a 3DO game called Way of the Warrior, which was this Mortal Kombat game uh, for the 3DO. And it did phenomenally well because there was no fighting games on the 3DO. This was, and this was the most expensive and powerful console you could buy at the time. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, I remember it was, it was, I was a rotoscoping artist for that. So basically they would shoot on black and white cameras themselves or, or actors dressed up in costumes that they had bought from Chinatown. It was so bad. <laughs> and, and so and so I would get these frames and there'd be like, you know, 300 frames and then, then I'm in using an early version of Photoshop and I have to hand colorize them. I have to hand uh, uh, anti-alias them and basically fix all their animations and stuff like that. So that was, that was my first, um, I think, um, experience as an artist on a game right so uh, i i kind of wear a lot of hats coding arting all that sort of stuff and so i did that uh and i was there when um i think who bought him first i think universal bought naughty dog first before, before yeah yeah i think so yeah and i was there when the facts arrived and they were so excited they got the facts with the the buy offer and and you know it, it wasn't a huge deal back then and you know Naughty Dog today would be worth so much more money, but they were so excited, and I was like, "What is this? What is this game business stuff?" And I was like, "What is this Universal stuff?" So I went back and in, in, in to law school, and third year of law school, I decided to skip all my classes and work on my first game company. And um, you can do that in law school because there's no homework, right? Every uh, the entire grade depends on your final exam. So I was working on. Um, uh, starting my own game company and 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 that time trying to raise m- money from friends and family and that type of thing, and I was working on the demo and all this stuff. And uh, I remember that I skipped all my classes and I crammed the whole last two weeks before finals in order to be able to graduate from law school. So I took a entire uh, you know semester worth of law school classes, condensed it. I didn't leave the apartment. I had groceries delivered to me. I didn't sleep and I just like crammed everything and I got like straight A's. So it was, it was really, yeah, better grades than when I went to class every day. That's, that's, that was really weird. So uh, gra- graduated from law school and immediately went into games. I didn't go into law at all. And um, we we're doing a uh, top down space shooter. Right. Because um, and then I remember that we were looking around for publishers for this thing and it was the dot com era and nobody wanted to talk to us unless we were making a web based game. And it was a huge period of consolidation in the industry. There were thousands and thousands of games coming out every year and Mm -hmm. it was too large to sustain. And so publishers were collapsing and being gobbled up on fire sales by bigger publishers. And this is where you got the big three, right? EA, Ubisoft, whatever they are. This is how how that all condensed and consolidated. But we found two companies that were interested. And one of them was um, Bungie in the early days, in the marathon days. and Pre-Microsoft were- Bungie. Pre Halo, right? And uh, mm-hmm. they were finishing up on Marathon, and then then they were going to work on this game called Halo, and they were they were excited about that. But they thought about <laughs> becoming a publisher, and so you know they they met with us. Um, I think we flew to to to, to San Francisco during uh, you know GDC, and we met with them at GDC, and we had a a deal that was inked, and it was going in the lawyers going back and forth, and. And we had a website for the game, so people could publishers could go check it out. And we we're about ready to sign with Bungie, <clears throat> and when the phone rings, 
And I get a call from Bill Roper from Blizzard Entertainment. It's like, this is Bill Roper from Blizzard Entertainment. We really like what you're doing here. We have a vision for doing um, a line of games for free on our balance service called Blizzard Arcade. And your, your arcade type game would be perfect for this. We would like to talk to you about a deal. And I said, ah, yeah, you guys are too late. I'm, I'm about to sign with Bungie. The document's probably arriving tomorrow. <laughs> but that's cool. Who are you guys again? Because <laughs> this is, this is uh, you know, I think Warcraft 1 days, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, we make, we make Warcraft 1, and, and it's an RTS. Oh, and Superman. Uh, Superman for the Super Nintendo. Remember that. And, and mm -hmm. I, I remember what I, I never I'll, I'll never forget what Bill Roper said. He, he he paused for a second after digesting this and he said, we'll kick the shit out of any offer Bungie has fly down tomorrow. And so I flew over to California from Boston and I went and I met Alan Adham, who not many people have heard of Alan Adham, but he's actually probably the reason Blizzard games have all the values that they did back in the old school days. He was one of the original founders, but he doesn't like the limelight. He never gives interviews. He stays out of it completely. You never hear about him, but he is the genius behind the game design and the game values, the values of our production development uh, in, in the old days of Blizzard. So he was a and very charismatic guy uh, and also uh, very powerful with Jedi mind tricks. And this, he uses these in design meetings all the time. We, we walk in disagreeing with stuff and walk out going, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he made a tremendous offer and we decided to go with Blizzard and we worked for Blizzard for a while and we helped them with, um, with StarCraft graphics, actually. They, they were working on a game called StarCraft and they were struggling with an art reboot um, because they got trashed at E3 and everyone made fun of, made fun of the game. Uh, look and style they called it works in space and so he said we need a new art style you guys have have are doing a lot of interesting stuff so we we helped them out with the art style for for uh starcraft a little bit and you can still see part of that original arcade game there's a crash spaceship in one of the maps that's actually the spaceship from the game we're working on but you know the, blizzard was doing another game called diablo with a third party Con, you know condor studios up north this is before they bought them and they 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 were putting all of their effort behind it and they said yeah we're gonna we're gonna be making this a, a tentpole game so they called up one day and bill said hey i'm i'm really sorry mark but uh we've decided to concentrate on only doing one game at a once and once and making it really big and we're not going to do blizzard arcade anymore uh so we want to cancel our contract but here's the thing we're we're going to pay you for they actually paid us for like two months and that's unheard of in the industry when a project's canceled usually that's it the money's gone and they said we're, not only that but you all have job offers you know why don't you bring your whole team over to blizzard uh you've helped us out so much you know why don't you why don't you come join us and there's a project we'd like you to lead and i was like oh i don't know i love boston i love the east coast but uh eventually you know there, we just couldn't find another publisher to pick it up because of the the dot-com boom uh nobody nobody had money for games it was all going towards web so i i was like fine uh i i decided to close the company i said told everybody hey we all have jobs waiting for us um and uh, i'm taking it i'm moving out to california and I'm the only one who took the job. Uh, one guy went to another, you know, one of the guys went to EA, worked on EA sports games for a while, uh, sucked his soul and he hated it. And he left after the industry after a short bit. Uh, another one went on to Xbox. Uh, my graphics programmer, really talented guy, did a lot of fundamental work on the original Xbox series. And another one started his own graphic design company and people went their different ways. Uh, but I'm the only one who decided to go to Blizzard. And that's when I started my, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I started with uh, this internal game that I was supposed to lead by a third party that I canceled. And then I was put on Warcraft Adventures and I canceled that. And then I got the nickname Sling Blade internally um, because I was <laughs> axing projects. And I, I said, this is my job. If I ax these projects, I have no job. But they kept me around. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, then I became manager of product development, and I was I was training all the producers and uh, working with uh, the multiple, trying to get us to get multiple games going at the same time. And ultimately, I went, um, you know, um, you know, I was producer on St StarCraft Brood War, StarCraft sixty four. Um, you know, worked on uh, a bunch of games there. Uh, Diablo two swallowed my soul. 
and then went on to lead the World of Warcraft team uh, because they they didn't have any leadership. It was all kind of gutted. The principals had left to go to found uh, ArenaNet and make Guild Wars. And that's my arc at Blizzard. So, and then we shipped WoW. And six months after WoW, I was once I was sure China was launched and we got everything launched, uh, I decided to leave and retire from games because games had totally uh, burnt me out. But I uh, ended up coming back to games because I loved it. And that's where I ended up now. And that's that's kind of long winded. But that's that's the arc. That's that's my story arc so far. So far. Nice. Yeah, that was nice. That's pretty, pretty impressive. Right. Um, so, yeah. yeah so, I, you know, can you comment or would you like to comment on, you know, Blizzard uh, today versus Blizzard then? Because it does seem like it's a completely different company now than it was back then. Yeah, I'm totally comfortable doing that because everybody that I worked with at Blizzard is gone. Uh, you know, uh, including my boss, the CEO, he's gone. Uh, all the top executives are gone. Everyone who was OG Blizzard, it, 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 they're just no longer there. So yeah. what you have at Blizzard now, I, I mean, I don't know them. Uh, I know I know a couple people, but, um, you know, for the most part, uh, it's all new faces. It's a completely different company. You you. you you know, it's not the same at all. So I don't mind talking about it. Uh, all my friends have uh, have long gone, so that's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Because um, yeah, the company definitely has changed. And this is one thing that you know we we talk a lot on the uh, Clownfish TV channel about is that you see uh, you know a brain drain when you've got you know founders of a company they start a company the company flourishes it gets popular. Uh, it, it gets an audience, whether it's, uh, you know, video games or comics or animation or whatever it is, right? Um, and they build their audience. And then usually the kiss of death is when they sell out to a corporation, some big corporation. They come in, they start making changes. And it's kind of like the whole, you know, ship of the the Theseus, right? Where, where uh, you know, the original company is no longer there. The name is there. The brand is there. I mean, look at like, you know, we talk about Pixar. Like, they still use the Pixar name, but John Lasseter's no longer there. So is it even the same company? So, you know, and I, I've noticed this myself just as, you know, someone who's who's played Blizzard games for a long time, that it does not seem like it's the same company at all. Mm -hmm. No, it's completely different. And it's a completely yeah. different industry, too, as far as AAA goes. Um, yeah. You know, we, we used to... It, the industry then and the industry now are staffed by two different types of people. The industry back then, there was no money to be made. You were literally, like I told the story about, um, you know, how I met Bungie first uh, was they were selling Marathon out of Ziploc bags at Macworld Expo in Boston. And, you know, and they were happy to make a couple grand that show. Um, it was not a job you took because you expected to make money or there was fame involved or it was even popular. In fact, it was kind of stigmatized if you played video games back then. Uh, only the nerds played video games and, um, mm -hmm. and, and not in the cool, nerdy way of today. Um, technology was not a big industry. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, panache. And so if you got into games, you did it because you loved it even though you could make much more money having a stable career somewhere else in software or, you know, become a doctor or a lawyer, accountant or uh, a marketing artist or that type of thing. No, we all did it because we couldn't stop playing games and thinking about how we wanted to make games. And we worked so hard that we crunched. And this wasn't because managers were telling us we had to work overtime. Uh, you know, this wasn't because we were being exploited. Uh, none of us were making money. None of us had, had could call this a career. We all just stayed up and we would we would make games all through the day. And then we would game together all through the night in the hallways of Blizzard. We'd pl be playing magic. We'd be playing, you know, anything. So uh, this was a lifestyle. And this was a very poor lifestyle. Um, and, and you know, and we, we did it and we got better and we had no skills sometimes. Like we didn't know what we were doing half the time. We taught ourselves. There was a lot of self-learning. Uh, we were trying to one up each other. If someone did something cool in the industry, we were like, that's really cool. Let's try to, let's try to beat that, you know? And, um, and that was what drove us and that changed. And later on, 
uh, games became a very big industry. Mm -hmm. And it just grew and grew and grew. And the market became more and more mass market. And you started to attract uh, a different class of game developer, especially, uh, you know, and this class of game developer uh, was very interested in the industry because it was um, it was growing fast and they wanted a career that was growing fast, but they wanted a career. You know, it was it was for different reasons. And they were gamers. They love they love games, too. And this is what they want to do. But they wanted more of a nine to five kind of job. Right. And then to go home after that and be with their families. And, you know, as I got older, I realized, hey, that's a totally valid lifestyle. You, you want a nine to five job. You want to you want to crank, do your best and go home to your family. Cool. But it does have repercussions. It has repercussions on. Let's just say the passion of gaming, right? The passion of game creation. And the reason we started hiring more and more of these people is because we had to grow these teams so fast and we needed very specialized skills and we couldn't self-teach ourselves some of this stuff. Some of this stuff was very esoteric. And so we started, we started, you know, we started off saying at Blizzard that we only hire gamers, right? And I think that started to change. I think that started to change, and we were like, well, we really need a specialist in hyperdimensional 3D uh, anisotropic, uh, you know, jiggle physics, right? And if you want someone like that, you, you, you can't have too many criteria. If they kick ass in this one specialty, you're going to overlook that maybe they only play mobile games, right? And it's like, okay, they, you don't really play the games in our in our industry, in, in our business, but you play in another, you play games in another one. Okay. And then this is kind of a slippery slope after that, right? As things get more and more specialized, uh, you, you start, you start going after the skills you need as a business because, and because the stakes are so high now and you kind of relax the other stuff. And then you have to have, because you're supporting, you know, developers with careers and families and everything else, then you have to change the culture uh, you know, um, and you have to be careful that what you assumed about crunching because you loved it is now a bad thing. And it is a bad thing. I'm not saying it was ever healthy to live that lifestyle, but you have to make sure that you're not doing it. And, you know, and, and it was all, I, I believe early crunch was not conscious. It was just something that we all expected to do as a team. And we were all excited to do as a team, but now you're like, Oh, wait, wait, these, these, these people have families, they have lives. Okay. We can't, we can't assume this and it's wrong to assume this. And we have to start changing procedures and things like this. So, and then games got so big that you started attracting another class of personality, which is the businessman, right? So the suits. And so now you're dealing with big money. You got to bring mm -hmm. in a, a full blown CFO. You got to bring in, you know, a, a lot of C-level executives that have mm -hmm. skills in this on hand, how to handle a public company and everything else. And they come in and they start diluting the culture. They're not product people, right? They're not, you know, and, and Steve Jobs talks about this. And so you get this slow metamorphosis of culture and then the games change and it's not about, hey, what cool game can I make that's going to be more interesting than that other cool game I just played the other week? It's more about we're about to drop, you know, 600 million on development here. Let's make sure that what we're doing is going to sell. So let's pick something safe. Let's, you know, uh, make sure that we, 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 you know, don't stray too far from the formula. And then that all changes. And now if, if you're a creative individual on a team, and you want to do games because you're passionate about it, but you're not allowed to because you have to stay within a narrow box. Two things are going to happen. One is you're probably going to leave games because, hmm. um, you know, I mean, this happens even on on OG teams. Nobody wants to work on a sequel. Right. Nobody wants to work on the expansion. Well, that was a constant problem we had. We all want to do something new, something cool. Um, so if you. If you're going to make Assassin's Creed 6 or 7 or whatever it's going to be, those people are going to be really bored of it. And your top creatives are going to leave. And uh, you have a lot of professionals left behind that maybe they don't care as much about, you know, what they're making as long as, you know, they have a good career and everything else. And, okay, they'll, they'll stick around and they'll make it. But the reasons change. The reasons are different. And... And the risks are no longer there. And the ones that want to take risks leave and make indie games, you know, that's what I did. Uh, or, you know, they just they just go into traditional stuff and say, I'm going to make my money elsewhere. So you have two different types of people staffing these companies now. In the old days, you had a different class of people 
maybe less specialized, maybe less skilled in some ways, but have a lot of passion and who are doing it for different reasons than the, the, the crews of today. And the crews of today are very professional, highly skilled. They know what they're doing. They can make fun games, but it's different. And maybe, you know, maybe you could tell me, was this the case with, you know, like movies in the old days versus movies now uh, or television? You know, what, what happened in other media industries and does this parallel it? Well, that oh. definitely I can pitch in on that one, and it does absolutely parallel a lot of industry uh, and in my experience and also in the broadcast industry as well because you'd have – in you once you get the suits involved and you're and it's amazing when you bring that up because it seems like that is the yep. standard and i remembered i actually had the privilege of speaking to um, larry elmore uh for a while and we were talking about the old days and tsr and things like that and and he it, same kind of situation he remembered very clearly he was in there with the artists they were drawing and they were doing stuff and then they started bringing in these what they called the suits and these people were not gamers you know and then and they would come in and, and ask them about oh can you draw this or draw that or how how's it going to go and then they would ask him well you know what are you going to do when the when you got a goblin with a, a dagger you're going to roll in a d4 or d6 or ask them any kind of questions or it gaming at all and they had no clue the only thing they yeah. understood was things like how much did the box cost and how much you could put on the shelf and this and that and all these other kind of number of things but what happened was is that you end up with those people in control. Those are the people that end up in creative control. Same thing in movies and television as well, because you have your investors. The investors say, well, I'm going to want X dollars by X day, you know, and you're going to make sure that that happens for me. And the suit goes in and goes, yep, that's my job. That's how I pay for all of my stuff. So I'm going to make sure that that happens. And then they, they, have to have that amount of control in the company to, to then you know like you said initiate crunch or have you know um be able to say well look, we're gonna go towards making this model more safe or or microtransactions or whatever it is that they want to try to do so you're right i mean it, it it constantly does that once a business gets to a level where there's a lot of money and that money wants more money and then it's like, that's it. This is about making money. Yeah. We don't care. We don't care if your game changes lives. We don't care if when people walk away from this game that they feel some sort of intrinsic value to themselves or make ch changes in their own life or their own structure because of what they experience in the narrative or the story of the game. I mean, we've all we've all experienced that. We've all had games when you get done with that and just like, wow, you know, or a great movie. Mine was, you know, Muppet movies and the uh, Rogers and Henson and all that kind of stuff. And you experience yeah. those. And the thing is, and I get a little bit, I'll, I'll stay more towards the rails on this, but what happens is, is we experience media. That media then becomes part of whom we are, what we are, especially when you're in your formative years or in your, any other type of time when you experience these different forms of media and games are extremely potent in that way because they're very interactive. You know, do you build your base here or there? Do you kill this NPC or not kill that NPC? Or, you know, what sort of situations and what sort of experience do you have that then become part of who you are? And as a creative myself, you know, you want at least I do, I want to make something that people go, wow, that was amazing. That changed my life, you know, when, and I could, I'll drop some spoilers. I'm sure we all know, you know, like when Sturm got stabbed by the, with the Lance from Kitty Ara kills him on the bridge. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. I, I, I'm sorry. I figured we were all grognards at least somewhat, but you read that and you go, oh, wow. That, and he stood for something and he meant something and you or something like that. You know, it, there's those moments and you don't, have a lot of that when you are having the suit that says, well, we needed to return X dollars. So if we make something that pisses off people, which is nowadays, I mean, I'm sure we have nowadays where they're yeah. like, man, no, we don't, we don't want to make the mob mad. We're going to just have nice safe games or have this or have that and not, not push boundaries, not have stories or have narratives that are that way. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it always seems to become that unless you have, what you were talking about in early blizzard where you have uh the gentleman that was running the, the running the games running this company in the background you know he was I'm, I'm sorry i forgot his name but he was running it right 
And Blizzard at the time, I remember, I was there. I was there 3,000 years ago. I was there, Gandalf. And so <laughs> Blizzard had the rep. They were not going to turn out any kind of crap. You knew that when you were done loading all the floppies, that it was going to be good. It was going to work. It was going to be solid. You weren't going to have problems with it. And, you know. Well, you know th- why that- we were able to do that? Hmm. Um. We resisted the suits for a long time. Like mm-hmm. there were many people, many companies that bought and sold Blizzard over the years uh, as the parent companies imploded, like Vivendi imploded. We, we were part of Universal for a while, Universal Vivendi. And uh, that was that was weird being part of a movie company. Uh, but we and they wanted to put their own uh, staff on our in our offices, their own IT, mm-hmm. their own HR and all this stuff. And yep. we said no. And yep. every time they had a bad suit idea, we said no. And the reason we were able to do that is because as a management team, we were united and we shielded all the devs from this because we didn't want devs to worry about corporate Mm -hmm. bullshit, right? And we said, no, the devs get to focus on one thing. They don't have to deal with any of your stupid bullshit and you're not coming here. I'm sorry. If they show up at the door, we're going to just call the police and turn them away. We were dead serious. And we said, don't fuck with us in no uncertain terms. And we used to say at Blizzard internally, we rule, they serve. And that sounds very egotistical, <laughs> but that was the <laughs> phrase we used when we formed this wall against corporatism. Mm-hmm. The problem is that only works if you're the golden calf. Yep. Okay. And this is yep. another point I want to bring up. Not only has the uh, the type of teams that work on games change, the audience has changed. Oh, yeah. So what, what do I mean by this? Okay. Blizzard brought in the lion's share of of revenue in the early days. But what happened was mobile gaming exploded Mm -hmm. and Activision started buying mobile game companies and they were now the golden calf. And so when they're pulling in most of the money, Mm -hmm. your political say within the umbrella of that giant corporation goes way down because Mm -hmm. it starts eroding. So it started eroding at Blizzard and up until the point where and now I'm getting into a little speculation. So this is, this is, you know, people wondered why the, one of the original founders and the CEO, my boss, Mike Morheim, stepped down from Blizzard. I, I think that was engineered. I think that, they, that Activision wanted more control. And I think that they gave him so much bullshit. And, and it was eventually like, here's your golden handcuffs. Mm-hmm. You know, can, we, can mm-hmm. we part ways? And that's speculation on my part. Because what happened as soon as he left? They put in their own people. It's like suddenly, mm-hmm. I think it started with the CFO. Uh, they handpicked the CEO, the new one of Blizzard, and he was an, an internal Blizzard guy, uh, probably bled Blizzard blue, as we used to call. And and he didn't last very long. And so they replaced him with with I think two other people, co presidents or something like that. I'm murking on the history, but that was when the takeover was complete. The entire upper echelon of executives left or you know uh, was gone and then suddenly you had the activision people brought in and that can only happen when you no longer have leverage within the corporate yeah. family and that's mm-hmm. because the bottom line isn't there anymore i mean blizzard was still making money hand over fist but compared to mobile and predatory monetization practices that are bringing in 10 to 100 x the revenue yeah you got nothing to say sorry yeah. we're gonna do it our way and uh mm-hmm. you have no leverage anymore yeah, and that's kind of we're we're seeing that right now. I think with Wizards of the Coast, you know, the the Hasbroification of of Wizards. Uh, Michael and I have talked about it, uh, you know, extensively. But mm-hmm. you see the new CFO, uh, or not the new CFO, sorry, the new CEO and the new head of Wizards are both from Microsoft, mm-hmm. and they are and they flat out said it. They actually said it in their last last call. They're they're trying to pivot Wizards into being a video game company. They yep. want Dungeons and Dragons to basically be a mobile app. They want you mm-hmm. to play their virtual tabletop. They want in-app purchases. They want to they want to monetize individual players rather than just selling one rule book to the DM for the entire group. They want everybody to pay. That's what their their end game is. And and at that point, you know, again to go back to the ship of Theseus, it's no longer Dungeons and Dragons. It's just another fantasy role playing game, mobile game. And that's what they're they're doing to it, and that's a Hasbro thing because they got to always that bottom line. You know, they always got to make more and more and more and more. And mm-hmm. 
you know, and, and you lose so much in the, the process. And anytime something gets sold, look at, you know, whether it's, you know, George Lucas selling Star Wars or, you know, to, to Disney, it's, it's as soon as you take the creatives out of it, you know, they may own the name, but they don't, I guess they, they own the name. They don't have the heart and soul of the company they bought anymore. It's my oh, opinion. yeah. And what's happening with, with D&D is so fascinating to me uh, because, you know, I, I play D&D. I think, we, you know, before the stream, we were talking in the, in the green room. And I, was, mm -hmm. I was blue box and with the dice that would chip and the crayons that would go in there. High quality um, stuff. Michael, yeah. you were red box. So that's that's a couple boxes after me. Uh, Neon, when did you start with D&D? Uh, it, it was red box. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I, I actually started. Uh, well, it was. Uh, ass backwards. I started out buying AD and D modules, not realizing that you had to go buy the books. And then the AD and D books. I, I was pretty young because I saw the older kids playing at school, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, these books are really complicated. So I went and got the red box, and we started with the red box. And then I went back a couple of years later, and I was able to finally play the Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, which uh, my son picked up a copy of that oh. module for me, by the way. And uh, he surprised me with it the other day. He's like, hey, Dad, because you're talking about it. I'm like, oh, my God, this brings back memories. That was like the first AD&D module I, I uh, played. But, uh, yeah, so I would say Red Box, and then I, I got more into second edition. Uh, I was so naive. I, I want to get to this point about what's happening with D&D and, and their virtual tabletop initiative and the bringing mm -hmm. in of uh, Microsoft executives that are video game oriented. I actually have a, a, a friend of mine who's actually on – the the vtt team uh but i got just the early dnd stuff reminded me of my first days and i gotta just tell this story about how naive i was um i didn't have the rule books right uh they're expensive i lived overseas in taiwan my the only guy that had them was the dm and i was coming into a campaign and i was the new guy and i guess i got the equivalent of a dnd virtual hazing because uh, I think, the you know, we started at, like, I forget what level, but White Plume Mountain was my first adventure ever, right? And so I went into White Plume Mountain, we got all this treasure, and then uh, old school D&D, it wasn't just about character development, you could also have uh, retainers, right? So, mm -hmm. and you could build keeps and have a castle. Mm -hmm. So I had a little castle going, I put all my treasure there and everything else. And then, I don't know, I had to go on vacation with my parents or something. I was gone for a week. I came back and the DM informed me, he's like, oh yeah, welcome back. Uh, you don't have any gold anymore or treasure because the other guys, they raided your castle and took everything. I was like, oh, okay. I guess that's the way the game is played. But they were really, they were really just kind of, in, that was my initiation ritual into this DM's campaign. So anyways, um, yeah, different different atmosphere back then, um, but yep. but the whole yep. point is that D and D is a social experience, and sitting around mm -hmm. a table is the best way to play it. I play on VTT now since co since COVID, right? Um, but you know, but the best way is still in person, and it amuses me no end that they are trying to create a video game out of D D. if you look at their virtual tabletop solution it's got full-blown animation spell effects everything else they're starting to automate stuff mm -hmm. and, and and you know and everyone's arguing well at, at what point is the line where you're no longer tabletop but you're a full-blown video game and i know what their strategy is it's like we will straddle both we will be in this new category mm -hmm. that will be a fine line between tabletop and video game no. well you know what what that is that's the same thing we used to say about the problems of designing multiplayer classes if you try to do two things at once you're gonna suck at both mm -hmm. <laughs> you're gonna suck at both and you yep. and and, and unless you have a tremendous amount of experience in how to blend this stuff and it has a unique niche role like multi-classing does, you're going to end up with a character nobody wants to play. Mm. And a, you know, in, in case of a, a hybrid character, you can easily screw that up and you can much more easily screw up being trying to create a new genre. That's not quite tabletop and not quite a video game. Pick your battles. You know, yeah. you yeah. guys have mm -hmm. this has never been done before. You guys certainly are not the people to try this. You have no. almost zero video game experience. And, you know, and you're not going to be Baldur's Gate because let's face it, hardly anybody is. Yep. And you're not going to be 
and you're going to start watering down the tabletop stuff. All your tools and stuff will be more video game focused because you're trying to monetize the shit out of that. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're going to end up in this awful middle and Critical Role is going to eat your lunch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody is. I mean, that's, that's so shocking about this is just, God, the uh, incompetence it, it Wizards uh, over the last couple of years. I mean, the OGL debacle and the fact that the the backlash was so severe that, you know, all these other game companies saw a massive uptick because, you know, people play tabletop. They want tabletop. They want to buy a tabletop game. So mm -hmm. if, if Hasbro is not going to give it to them, they're going to go someplace else. Yeah. One of the things I find fascinating about the OGL debacle is how they managed to erase it. It's it's now it's gone. I mean, of course, now people's attention spans don't last very long. But yeah. if you look, it was a huge brouhaha. Then they had their summit, and they had the creators, go, the the YouTubers, yeah. and all that sort of kind of stuff. Now you look around. What what are those YouTubers all talking about now? They're back to talking about D and D. It's all back to good old talking about D and D. D you know all of them, and it's just like. As if nothing happened. Yeah, that, as that's if not nothing ever went long. on. As, as soon as Critical yeah. Role drops covering D and D in their games, that that you know that's gone. Oh, I, they I, did. That, yeah, Crit Crit Roll already went on with their own. They have their own now. They have a different setup. Mm -hmm. They sort of borrowed, adopted. I haven't really read a lot about it, but basically there was a little over? scandal. Yeah, they switched over. They have a totally different. They're not playing D and D anymore. They're playing a different, completely different setup. And uh, there was a little scuffle online that I saw about they were talking about whether or not they developed it, you know, the crit roll team developed it, or whether they got it from another game developer. And then the game which, developer which that system? they have two systems, which system are they playing? I'm, I'm yeah, trying to remember the exact out. name of it. I'll have to look it up here. Let's see, crit roll a new system. Yeah, they, they, got, they, got two. they got a they got a narrative heavy one and then they got a, a yeah they're publishing two new rpg systems uh let's see because that drives their whole audience you know yeah uh, i would have it, to look it up but and, and they have done so much to make D, &D mass market yeah yeah even if yeah, but they're not playing D, &D anymore yeah they're yeah. not they are not playing D, D anymore they've gone away from that they have their own system and I'm, basically and I'm, that they adopted but yeah, yeah and i'm telling you that uh that every you know the the whole oh everyone's gotten over ogl and they've switched back to dnd &D. that's only going to last until their new game is out because mm -hmm. you know right now yeah maybe they drop dnd &D from from their coverage but there's nothing else that players can play right now but and and i know that most of their audience doesn't play you know dnd &D. they 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 more they're, they're an ecosystem that watches D and D play, right? Yes, this yes. Whole thing around mm -hmm. it. Uh, but you know, as soon as the products are available and they finally ship their 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 new system, um, I think I think Hasbro's in huge trouble. And I think Hasbro doesn't know how to do software and is going to completely screw up their VTT. And that and 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 they're going to monetize the crap out of it, and it's going to be a flaming wreck. And uh, it's going to be a shadow of a brand, and Hasbro's going to dump it. They're going to sell it. That, that's been speculated for a while. Like, that goes back to mm -hmm. um, pre-pandemic. There, there were uh, some people talking on, I think it was uh, ICV2, that there were rumors that Hasbro was trying to give WotC as much curbside appeal as they could, and that the end game was to pawn it off onto like Tencent or something. You know, and that that might be part of why they're I mean, just speculation on my part, but it might be part of why they're trying to go with the video game route. Like this is going to be more attractive to a potential buyer than a tabletop game, a board game. Yeah, well, Baldur's Gate just screwed that plan. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, because talk about that. Because, uh, uh, you know, Tencent's not looking at, at that, that property. They're, they're looking at uh, the, the guys who made Baldur's Gate who can actually execute on the plan. And what will happen is they'll they'll try to get their hooks into into larian uh and and i don't think larian's for sale the ceo said he's never going to sale but i don't know a couple billion dollars can talk you know what i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know what's kind of crazy about all of that is that i don't really see you know because we've all been around the block several times but when i have seen the youtubes and everything i'm not really seeing a lot of innovation I guess. I mean, I'm looking at this going like, well, I had this when I played Mass Effect. I had people talking about and choosing dialogue trees and animated, you know, little cutscenes. And it's like, okay, we've already been doing this for quite some time, you know, and or the scene where 
even this just the screen of when you're looking at your own character and you're deciding what your character is going to be wearing. I mean, that just looks like the loading screen for Elder Scrolls Online. I'm like, that looks like Elder Scrolls Online. Exactly. So what, you know, I'm, I've been trying to understand other than the fact that it is, it is, you know, in my personal opinion, I think it should be adult, you know, it should be an AO rating because it's basically a massive dating sim, I guess. I mean, well, it, like... <laughs> yeah, you can do. I mean, my son's playing it right now, and he's like, "My God!" He said, "You can do anything in this game you can possibly imagine." Like, yeah, and it's full it's graphics insane. and everything. Like, yeah, they're yeah. not. It's we're not talking about where it's blurred or anything. It's there. It, it's going. two things. It's two things. One is like you said, "Hey, there's nothing new here." I was playing this back in the old school days. Well, that's exactly it. You can't get that experience anymore. Right. Um, you know, you, you it, this is where gameplay was deep and there was challenge to it to overcome. So you you get that dopamine hit in a way that you that's I think longer lasting and more powerful than just getting the next shiny loot drop in Diablo 4, right? Mm -hmm. Um and you have deep mechanics that matter. You have tactics that matter. Uh you know, and you, and so you feel more accomplished when you do it. They have a huge storyline that's rich. Then the characters grab you in the tutorial. And, you know, I was looking at the difference. Oh, I'm going to get into trouble again. I was looking at the leaked Starfield footage of the first 40 minutes of gameplay. Uh oh, uh oh. And, uh, and I, I got to be careful. You know, I'm not going to be careful what I say. Uh, I'm going to just <laughs> say, I, I, I I, I'm going to be the bad boy of the industry. I'm going to speak my mind because that's my freedom, right? As soon as I start to box myself in, I don't have my self freedom anymore, and that's that's not good for me. That's mm -hmm. I don't I don't play that game. So, uh, you know, it's very polished. The Starfield stuff is very polished, but you meet two characters in the beginning, and I won't give any spoilers. It's just a tutorial, and you don't care about them at all. And the high point of the action of the tutorial is you mine a rock. All right. Con contrast that with Bal with, with Baldur's Gate 3 or even Skyrim, okay? Let's talk mm. about not even Baldur's oh, Gate 3 because yeah. people say that's an outlier, that's an exception. Okay, in Skyrim, you're immediately curious about what happens because why? You're in a cart, you're a prisoner, mm. right? And, you're, and the stakes are high. What are the stakes? You're going to be executed. And you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then, you know, uh, I forget what happens. This is a dragon attack that comes along. Yeah, the dragon comes in and, and wrecks the place, and then you're able to escape, and, and you have that. And you're right. And that's that's a key part of narrative design. Epic. Where, yeah, it, you, and you, it hooks you. It draws you in. You're immediately invested. You have to build that investment immediately. You've got to get that going on. And even back in the day, I mean – it, the, it, we had that. We had that investment. And so, that's like what when Baldur's when Kerrigan turned into the Zerg Queen, and I'm just and you're just like, oh, oh God, yeah. what? man, and you feel it. It's you like cared oh. about Rainer. You cared about Kerrigan, yeah, you cared about we had them. Minimal cutscenes for that. Yeah, minimal, yeah. You know, there, there were no direct cutscenes for most of that. It was all done in in-game dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. But you cared about these characters. Baldur's Gate three. You know, one reason people get attached so quickly is because even in the tutorial, you are immediately – you've got a great villain. You've mm -hmm. got great stakes. If you don't fix this thing, you'll die, you know, uh, and you're introduced to NPCs right along the way that you care about, and the battle scene is just over the top. Right. Mm -hmm. And so your combat tutorial doesn't feel like a tutorial. Um, and and that's what that's what makes that game engaging from a story perspective is that you care about the characters immediately and uh, you have the, the deep mechanics that are going on and you uh, you can ex they exploit the medium of video games. I talk about this a lot. So many people do not understand this in the on my own industry. What is the medium of books? It's words, right? Uh, what is the medium of movies? Do you sit there and put a lot of exposition on the screen? No, you use moving pictures to and to convey the emotion and the and and the story in a way that words alone cannot do. You have a mm -hmm. transformation, a step there. Nobody mm -hmm. goes back, you know. And then when you get to games, your medium is now interactivity. It's what can I do? And Baldur's Gate has a lot of sandboxy elements and creative ways that you could do almost anything in the game to get around a problem, right? It exploits the medium perfectly with interactivity. And so many games try to be movies. 
they try to like just give yeah. you cut scene after cut scene after cut scene and they they make the interactivity more and more vestigial and that's mm-hmm. like a movie trying to be a good movie by printing words on a screen it's like oh we you know like a game doing cutscenes is like a movie that says we need to put pages of a book on the screen and have people read it you are not exploiting the interactivity so Baldur's Gate 3 exploits the interactivity as characters and rich storytelling that you care about and brings back old school uh, risk reward gaming, right? Uh, where if I take this risk, I could get a great reward and I need to have some amount of skill and I have to be engaged with the interactivity to overcome it. Three pillars that they nailed. That's why it's an outlier, not because they're experts in their field i mean we're, you're a triple a mm-hmm. studio you, you should be a fucking expert in your field <laughs> don't give me this crap and and mm-hmm. you know what and if you're an expert in, in games you can you can design almost any genre of game it actually crosses over very well because the fundamentals are the same so that to me is is why Baldur's gate 3 is is such a success as a game plus i think it streams really well which is important we call that over the shoulder appeal back when there wasn't streaming at blizzard we said it's got to be important that your friend who's looking over your shoulder playing the game says i want to play that too all right now you build it so that you make sure that it's it's interesting for streamers to talk about there's there's things that happen that streamers can talk about as as you play that's the modern equivalent of that over the shoulder so that's what i think makes you know baldur's gate the the game of the year as far as i'm concerned right now mm-hmm. so it has so ha- far so far so far so far so has has streaming has that changed uh, game development then in your opinion have or, or studios developing games like you said to have that o- over the shoulder no, I, I, I actually don't think they think too much about that i think oh, they okay. need to think okay. i think they need to think more about that um i think what you have is um is that it's not the game developers that are building for Twitch. It's it's that marketing has figured out that Twitch is where to go, right? And uh, they realized that uh, if, if they could do zero marketing and just hire a bunch of Twitch people to play and blitz Twitch for a solid month and they can have phenomenal sales for a title no one's ever heard of. What game mm-hmm. am I talking about? Apex Legends. Yeah. Right? Apex mm-hmm. Legends, nobody knew it was in development. It came out of left field, but they went and they hired all of these streamers to do it. And I don't think they even had in-game drops at the time. Maybe they did, but that was a refinement that came either then or a little bit later where streamers could give away codes for in-game items and things like that, giving another incentive to watch this stuff. That was the that was the, the key. And now they figured it out that influencers are important and Twitch streamers are important. I was doing that back in the day with my studio, Red5. I had a whole department set up. The Twitch founders, back when Twitch was nothing, came over to our offices just to hang out. And we would talk and they were so cool. And they and 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 I really believed in their vision that we actually, uh, we were the first to integrate Twitch streaming. They used to have a way that you can integrate streaming directly into the game. So mm-hmm. you know, our game could connect directly to Twitch and you could stream if you wanted to at the push of a button. And uh, we we did one of the first, uh, we did Firefall Fest, which was a live fest. And we brought, and also nobody knew about influencers. I brought in people to play. I said, let's get some, let's get uh, Day9 in there. He was a big esports guy. Uh, let's get Felicia Day. Uh, let's get Nathan Fillion, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and let's bring him in. And it was much more economical to do that now. Now rates are, are super high for that. We were, we were the first to do that. And I can tell you, I pissed off my marketing department, which was run by a vice president of EA that I had hired. And I had a hard time trying to find someone who understood where marketing was going. And they trashed it. They're like, why are you building a, 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 a streaming studio. And, and let's face it, it was a tiny warehouse that we got for cheap down the street, right? Yeah. But we, yeah. <clears throat> and we built some two by four sets. We didn't spend a lot of money on this. Um, <clears throat> we spent money on lighting and equipment because we, we wanted, we, you know, we wanted good production values. I wanted production values that were far in advance of the time because I knew that that's where this was going. And I wanted, uh, anytime people look at our older content, I wanted it to hold up. So, uh, and so that's where it all went. And I understood that that as far and marketing wise was where it went. And from my blizzard background, I knew that over the shoulder appeal was important, but I think today 
you have marketing fully understanding the importance of Twitch. <clears throat> and the game developers, I, I don't think they're thinking about that so much. I don't think they're thinking about, hey, am I presenting a, an interesting thing to show here? I think they're just making the game. Is there room to think more about that? I think so. But at Blizzard, we didn't obsess about over the shoulder either. We just were aware of it. It's like, okay, this, this should this should be fun to stream. This should be fun. This should be fun for someone to watch, you know. Well, this this could actually segue into talking about uh, independent games and gaming journalism because you know so many independent games became a thing, uh, became you know pop culture icons because of streamers, because of YouTubers, because of Twitch. I mean, I'm thinking you know Among Us, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. I mean, these these indie games otherwise maybe normally wouldn't have nobody would have paid them any attention, but because we had big YouTubers, big streamers playing them. These, you know, $5 bargain bin games wound up being a thing. Like, I think Among Us, it was, what, like two years after it came out that became a thing because of YouTubers? Yeah, and 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 that's because it plays super well as a reaction game. Like, yeah. reaction videos are very popular, and Among Us is a great game for for reaction shots from Twitch streamers, right? So I, I, I think I'll amend that. It's not just over-the-shoulder appeal now. you got to give the streamer something to react to. Uh, in order to get that that emotional you know moment uh, during a stream, that's cool. So what um, what is your take on uh, indie gaming right now? It seems like there's a, a massive uptick in just the quality and diversity in in indie games these days. It's it's pretty amazing. I'm so glad because I mean AAA has evolved into an industry that as a creator I'm just no longer interested in and politically I'm no longer interested in because the office politics are brutal now. It's yeah. it's definitely Dilbert land. Um and that's not <laughs> something I'm I, I I like the old school, right? I, we were talking about this again before stream in the green room where we were talking about uh bl old school blizzard you sort of like that was your family you worked there during the day and at night you game together and you know we we were like uh we were a, a tight band and and unfortunately there were not too many women back then in the industry uh i used to try to like deliberately recruit women from you know all sorts of places mit and everything else mm. and nobody wanted to because games were not a career at the time and um and so we we couldn't get that that wider appeal and get more people into the company um, but you know, we were like, uh, you know, I don't know. I was about to say band of brothers, 40 K space Marines. We were, you know, we, we love being, uh, trying to be badasses. I mean, we were geeks, right? But so when I say badass, I don't mean that we can, that we're all like working out and we're buff. I mean that we're like hardcore nerds and we're, we're really trying to like, you know, be the best nerd we can be and out nerd everybody else. Um, and that was that, there was that, that sort of camaraderie and when, and we would also argue with each other in design decisions, knock down, drag out arguments. But when we left that conference room and had made a decision, we all banded together, right? It's like, okay, we're, we're going to do this. And uh, and we're going to put our, our all behind it. So uh, very different environment back then. Uh, I, I, I forgot how we got on this topic. What were we talking about? <laughs> indie games, indie games. Indie games. So, indie games, yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, so I don't like the way the AAA industry is now because the AAA industry is catered towards a, a ultra casual market. Now, mm. at Blizzard, one of the secrets of OG Blizzard success is we did cater to the casual gamer. But... That has changed. The casual gamer back then was still a hardcore nerd gamer by today's standards. Yeah. Okay. And we used mm -hmm. to call have what we called the donut theory, which was a really and Alan came up with this, and I never understood the analogy uh, because he said the market that we are is the donut. You have got the fleshy, doughy goodness outside, which is the casual gamer, but the whole of the donut is the hardcore fans, and you got to give both of them a reason. Everyone should be able to play our game and finish it. But then after the game is done, you got to give the hardcore some some mode that they latch onto to play long term. And the hardcore influences the casual studio. And that worked for a long time. And we also weren't trying to be a mass market brand. We used to say, uh, Alan used to say that we are the Gucci of games. Not that we're like super expensive or you know nose in the air, but we we are we are like uh, I guess the word we would use today is bespoke right or artisan we we are art, we're an artisan game company we're not trying to be mass market and one of our mottos was don't be don't be greedy don't be too greedy uh you know because if you get too greedy you start doing making decisions that compromise the game mm 
So that was the philosophy then. But the market changed, as we talked about mobile, uh, something else that also changed is right around WoW, and, and maybe this is our fault, WoW had a lot to do to broaden the market and make it mass market. The South Park episode on WoW, everything else, suddenly gaming was mainstream. And what happened then was you got a new class of casual gamer. Mm -hmm. And the new class of casual gamer, um, they just want an experience. They want to push a button to advance to the next part of the game. They want to sit down, drink a beer after a hard day's work. You know, uh, they got kids, maybe they don't have a lot of time. They just want to like have a good campaign, say, yeah, I finished the game and not have anything that's going to be too much of a challenge because they don't got the time for it. I'm not saying they're not skilled. If they wanted to, I'm sure they could they could do it. But that's not the experience that they want. And then you have the casual gamer, uh, the old what we used to call the casual gamer. Uh, they got older and they got families too, and they had less time to play games, right? And I don't, and and so now we that that, but that's still there. The casual gamer donut is still there, but it's not catered to anymore. It, you either mm -hmm. are catering towards the the huge mass market, or you're targeting mobile games, which is even bigger, uh, and or as an indie, you are targeting very sort of small niche genres. Mm. But what's happening is you're getting something in between, right? Because indie games used to be pixel games. They used to be very short games, very simple mechanics because the tools were very hard. You had to program everything from scratch. Uh, the art tools were very primitive. It was, you know, you didn't have the, the means to make anything more than that. But as we get better tools, as the engines are, you know, you can get great free engines, right? If you're an indie gamer, you got Unity, you got Unreal, you can make, you can make a triple A game out of that if you want to. You can compete with the big boys more and more. You have the rise of AI, which is making coding challenges easier, which is making, you know, some uh, art challenges easier. If you wanted to go that route, um, you can start to you make a game that approaches the experience that you could get uh, out of AAA. And this has left room for that. You know, the former casual gamer market, which still exists, different age group now, but they are not the mass market. They have time to play games, but they want a challenge and they want genres they can't get from AAA. That is a huge niche that is starting to open up for indie gaming. And I think that uh, uh, Larian's not a, an indie gamer. I would say they're what, what I call uh, a double A studio, right? They're a double A studio in size and in resources doing a triple A game now, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that what's happening now is finally the technology and the tools are, are, are at a point where even with a small team, you can accomplish an awful lot and you can start to, and this audience, which has felt neglected for so long because mm -hmm. AAA doesn't cater to them, now wants something to play and this is a great time to jump in there. And that that's the target of my company. It's like, I'm not trying to be AAA. I'm not trying to be an indie studio. I'm trying to be you know, right in the middle there, we're with a small team and not a lot of resources because the last thing I want to do is deal with suits, right? Um, I can take these tools, I can use them to my advantage, and I can cater to the audience that, I, that, that we used to at Blizzard. And that's what I'd like to do. And I'm not trying to make another billion dollar franchise. I have like $3 billion franchises under my belt. That's not my interest, right? I just want to fulfill that vacuum that I as a gamer want again, that Baldur's Gate 3 definitely tickled in me. I want to go back to that. And those are the types of games I want to make. So yeah. um, do you think that there could come a day where, where uh, you know, some indie games could supplant the AAA titles? You know, somebody could come out with the next wow from an indie studio and just completely blow, you know, Blizzard or Larian out of the water. Uh, yeah, I think uh, tools are getting better and better, both on the creative side as well, uh, the art side, as well as the coding side, that that's, that's a possibility. But you still have to have the good game plan. That's always yeah. an outlier. Uh, you know, you're going to have it, – it, it doesn't mean that just suddenly you're going to have a flood of and every indie game is great it just means that indie games can start to deliver closer to those triple a experiences and if they pick the genre right where the scope and and resource scale doesn't matter they could absolutely and they have the right game design they could absolutely blow a triple a studio out of the water and and what's going to happen is triple a will go down that road and start copying them mercilessly or they'll just buy them yeah mm-hmm 
Yep. That's, that's what we see a lot of, right, Michael? We see a lot of uh, uh, these smaller studios do something really great. And then next thing you know, they're getting gobbled up by a corporation and kind of lose yeah, their identity, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It, it because, you know, of course they're, they want to make the money. They'd love to make the money and, and maybe it turns into, Oh yeah, we'll let you keep going. You'll be able to do everything you want to do. Just sign on the dotted line, totally pat you on the back and you, and you believe them because you sure, George. To believe them. Sure, yeah. We're going to yeah, do yeah. seven, eight, nine. And the next yeah. thing you know, it's like, meet your new boss. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, that sort of a situation. It's, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. No, I was just saying that we do see that quite often that's happening and, you know, and, and it also is that they're, they're chasing that brass ring because they, they want to make money. They need to make money, enough money to be able to live or have their, you know, work life balance and pay their bills and that sort of thing. So it's interesting to watch because they'll, they'll see something make money. They'll, so they try to make something similar to that, you know, they, the AAA makes all this money. We're going to make something similar to the AAA instead of being able to sort of go off on their own path and and make something of their own uniqueness because unfortunately it the, it's just so saturated it's ridiculous it's there's so much out there the thousands and thousands of games that are just and you know how do you compete how do you rise above that and you really touched on that uh, Grums because you, you you get people to play it. You know, you make your Among Us and then you keep going out there to the influencers. Hey, check this out. Hey, what's up? You know, what do you think of this? And it's very similar to back in the broadcast industry. What would you do? You'd make a product and then you would make a bunch of those products and send them all to the celebrities and be like, here's all your free samples of all the free stuff. And, you know, if you really enjoy it, maybe you'll say something about it or we could talk business or something like that. You know, so then maybe you get Shaq to go, I like this orange juice, you know, who knows? <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's it's that's that's the same pattern. It's the same model. It's just we have people that attract an audience, and then we try to get those people to play your game. So you send it to them, and what can you do? What kind of deal can you make? What kind of money can they can you offer? Or if you can't offer money, maybe you're whatever it is. You know, it's, it's just very similar to see that, and and that's I think like you also alluded to was that they they don't know that aspect of it. You know, you could have somebody that could jump into RPG maker and make totally awesome game. Like, yeah, this is cool. I, I really like this, but they have no clue how to market it. They got no, no clue how to reach out to influencers or who to reach out to or how to do it or any of those. So, so there's all this, I call it a fish ladder. You know, I don't know. I'm from Oregon, so I know what fish ladders are. I don't know if you all know what a fish ladder is, but it's where you build the stairs next to the dam that the fish have to then hop up there. And they don't know how to hop up the next step. They go, oh, I'm a fish. I know how to get here. Now, how do I get to the next level? And how do I get there? I don't know. I don't know how to get there. And they're also competing with the 50,000 other fish and trying not to get eaten by a bear. That, you that's your, that's so, your indie mobile game, Michael. Fish ladder. Yeah. Fish ladder. <laughs> Fish yeah. ladder. You get to the next level by paying 99 cents. That's how you get to the next level. Well, exactly. Because you got to have the microtransactions and you've got to have all. And it's there's so many wonderful rabbit holes we can go down to because we have you this wealth of knowledge. One of the things I was hoping that we could bring up as we were talking about Blizzard um, and talking about the MMO and how World of Warcraft seemed to crack open the mainstream. Because we always, you know, we were all sitting around cafeteria playing our D&D, playing our games. Or you'd go to the arcade and you'd have the over the shoulder, you know, you're watching that score rise. And you're just like, is he going to do it? Are they going to? Oh, he got the ghost. Okay. And, you know, maybe you put your quarter up on the screen, that sort of thing. But uh, then when WoW hit, it, it, yeah, it went crazy. It went, you know, I mean, you had Shatner. You had all these celebrities. You had Felicia Day with don't don't you want to date my avatar and it just kind of just went nuts to the point where anybody the casuals so like you said you brought in you had all your hardcores that came over and they're doing their their raids you know 40 man raids and things and then you had your casuals that could come in there and you know I was sort of in the middle I had a guild that we ran a horde guild that we ran and I loved the Torin culture I just grafted onto that so tightly it was a torn guild and the whole thing and we would just sit there and play and i i we made games i made a torn ball game that we played at the village and all this other kind of stuff and, and make bread i was like i would go in there and spend half an hour making mulgore spice bread 
<laughs> it was like, and that was my gaming. I was like, there you go. I got my gaming fix. I made some bread. I put it, I gave it to people. It was fun. It was just sort of interesting. And so, well, I guess where I'm going with that is, and you talked about that sort of the niche you're going for, you know, you want to bring back some being able to be a casual, you know, being able to go in and, and, and have a rewarding experience but you don't necessarily have to be good at good enough to do dark souls or something. You're not, you know, elite to do that, but you want to have a rewarding experience. So my question then where it all comes down to is when you are designing your game and you're considering the casual player, what do you, how do you feel about what's now coming out that I see is story mode? You know, you do story mode, everything's easy. You're not going to die. You get to do the story. What is your take on that? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> story mode games are, are very popular with the AAA crowd, right? Um, they, like I said, they're the, the type that we just don't have as much time online anymore for mm -hmm. because <clears throat> we have so many competing attentions online. We have work online. Um, we have uh, social media. You know, uh, we've got Instagram. We've got, you know, got Facebook still. When's that going to die? Please die. Pretty soon. Um, <laughs> it's, it's getting there. We're in, in the uh, And so we can hope. And, and, you know, back in the day, back WoW, part of what made WoW super popular and what made MMOs as a genre super, super popular was they were an online social network before there were social networks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, your friends were there, your guilds were there. You didn't mind a slower pace of gameplay uh, because, or, or even downtime in EverQuest, staring at a book. Because you were chatting with your friends during that yeah, time. Yeah, you were waiting for the mob to spawn. That's what we would do. We'd all sit around, and then we were literally standing in a line, you yeah. know. And you didn't and have a smartphone. You didn't have text going on. You didn't have Twitter. You didn't have Facebook. You, you This was it. So we were the social network. And mm -hmm. and in order to, to partake in that social network, you had to game a little bit. Um, so... I think that's why it exploded as a cultural phenomenon. And I think that's why MMOs are more niche these days. Uh, some would say they're kind of dying, but they still make plenty of money, especially in Asia. It's because, and, but it's, it's definitely why MMOs now cater to uh, much faster leveling times, no downtime, uh, you know, uh, ju jump into your dungeon finder and, and go dungeon to dungeon and get in and get out. It's that type. And it's more of a single player experience because the social stuff was supplanted by stuff that's a lot easier and faster and gets the, the socialization done quicker uh, you know, through other means. You don't need MMOs to do that anymore. And that's why a lot of the stickiness is gone because stickiness comes from socialization. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have socialization, you're going to MMO hop. Because your friend, you know, your friends don't stick around. The other thing that's happening is, oh, you, you guys touched on this is, um, uh, and I, I don't know, Neon, if you brought up this point in one of your your videos, uh, but we're losing our uh, pop culture. Yeah, uh, everything is fragmented. We have we have so many uh, niche, uh, you know, pursuits, and you look at, you know. Um, even something like TikTok, like my daughter is always on TikTok and there's, you know, all these little subclasses of, we've got like book TikTok, game TikTok, you know, this TikTok that, and, and so even if you're using TikTok, you're not all using the same TikTok. You're all having a very, uh, uh, you know, tailored experience. And so, I mean, my own personal opinion is, yeah, because we're not all watching the Cosby show anymore, uh, you know. We're not all watching Friends anymore. It's like everybody's watching whatever streaming show, and you're not getting as many people watching each individual show. But there's there's something for everybody. But unfortunately, we don't have those shared experiences anymore. Yeah, the water cooler moments where you you watch yeah. you know Lost mm -hmm. in the evening, and then you and yep. then work it next day. You gather around the water cooler and you talk about the last episode of Lost and how crazy it was. Uh, people are watching different things, uh, streaming services, everything, and music too. Uh, people don't listen to the same bands anymore. There are no, there's no mega bands. I mean, aside from like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, obviously there were a few, but not like it was back in the day where everyone was listening to the same stuff because you're all getting it from radio, a single point source. Now it's, um, it's algorithmically tailored to you. Yeah. And um, basically the, you know, AI is, is, is figuring out what you like and giving you more of that. 
Um, and if he discovers, and it's more about discovering in a vast sea of media out there, what is it that you like? And it's going to be a totally different mix than what your friend likes. And that is happening with games too. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that you're, that, uh, there's no longer sort of like a watershed game that everyone plays. I mean, I mean, I guess there is still with some AAA, but it's it's less and less. And definitely with indies, it's more about finding your audience and targeting them and giving them a great experience. Uh, what is it that they want? That's what you have to do to succeed. I don't think you can be the one the one game that rules them all. That's a very outlier thing right now. Uh, you just have to find your you know your your circle of buddies that enjoys the same same type of game that you do, and 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 do the best job you can entertaining them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that, that, sorry, go ahead. Oh was, no, go ahead, Michael. Well, it would, this reminded me when you were talking about the fracturing of uh, and and as we interweave culture with gaming and gaming being an interactive media, which is then it becomes part of our culture and part of who we are, and it it really becomes part of a tapestry of sort of as we had so we had our culture and we have the water cooler moment right so you had the people at your work that were your buddies you'd all talk about lost and that was its own sort of group that sort of subculture thing and we'd also have you know people so when we were growing up it was like hey did you get to level eight or nine on mario or did you you know then if we had a game it was narrative part did you kill this boss or solve these things and so we had those those uh you know groups and what it seems unfortunately now is that it seems that it is shifted to in, in the gaming industry uh, and in the entertainment industry, the politicizing and the tribalization and the fracturing of it. So we'll go down this dark rabbit hole. This is the not fun part of witnessing the people that go and say, well, you played Hogwarts Legacy. So now you're a blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you you played Baldur's Gate. So that makes you a blah, blah, blah. And it's amazing to me to watch this because I sat here and I actually did a little video. And I was like, no, this is, I mean, you're, you're, you're really, it's this crazy exaggeration of what it was back in the lunchroom. If you all remember that, you'd go to lunchroom and like that table is the hicks and that table is the jocks and that table is the preps and that table is the nerds and there's the drama geeks and you, we, everybody had our own little things and clicks and groups and we'd all be in there. But now all of a sudden, instead of, you know, going out and saying, well, in the gaming industry, it is becoming this politicizing part of it. And it's, I think part of it is that we're searching for that culture. We don't have it anymore. Yeah. We, we, you, yeah. yeah you'd log into EverQuest and you're all standing around. And you didn't even need to know them. You didn't even know who they were, but it was like, yeah, we're waiting for the orc to spawn so we can all get the plus one ring. Okay, cool. Sit around and talk, you know. Hey, did y'all see how much RAM is now? Yeah, four megs for, oh my gosh, you know, whatever. You know, stuff. We had similarities because we we're all in a similar environment with similar things and similar stuff, and you could bond and you could meet and you could talk and things like that. And but we don't now. We don't have that. We you you like you just said you MMO hop. It's because you can jump into your MMO, hit Dungeon Finder, go to the dungeon. You don't know anybody, so the experience is completely and utterly different than raiding with your guild or finding friends or something. And you jump in there. And it's like okay, well, hopefully I'll get. You know, my my plus two bow will drop once we finally, you know, do the mob or whatever. And but then you leave. Everybody comes together, it's leave. It's like it's like a hookup. You just Yeah, hey, yeah, sure. And we leave. Yeah, yeah. we're here. Now we leave. I, 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 that's what it felt like to me. And so that's when I was kind of like, you know, no, this isn't this isn't what I want. I want a game that I feel part of something, a culture, a group, uh, you know, a uh, um a society or something more than just I popped in. I knew where to stand because I I knew not to stand in the glowing sp spot, so I didn't get everybody killed. Whatever, you know. I was like, meh. This is and a great danger for humanity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and technology is great, but technology has has done some terrible things to us as a society. And mm -hmm. this is why this is this is a big contributing factor, I think, to the rise of loneliness mm -hmm. and the lack of connection. And the feelings, the growing feelings of alienation. You take, you know, the the problem of the the fracturing of the pop culture because we don't have, we're not Europe. We don't have thousands of years of history, right? I used to joke that in America, pop culture is our culture. You know, mm 
um, and um, our collective memory as a society and stuff we could agree on. Right. We, we all we all like to watch Lost or we all like to do this. We all like to do that. And as you lose that, you, you get these smaller communities, but they're not even people you meet. It's just people online. And you stop having things in common in culture to identify with. All you have left is your own identity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, helps feed the rise of tribalism and identity politics, too, um, because that's we have increasingly less to share uh, in yeah. common with each other. And we are being balkanized by the algorithm. The algorithm is driving us apart. Mm -hmm. OK. And uh, Neon, I know you're not a fan of Twitter, but I saw an interesting um, thread on Twitter where I think, uh, oh, I think it was Cat Turd saying this. Right. The infamous cat turd. He was saying that Twitter is trying to drive us all towards the middle. Meaning what? Meaning the middle that, of what? That that he because he was he was saying it because he feels he's being throttled and shadow banned, right? And because he's he he represents one extreme of the spectrum. Other right, people right. represent the other stream of the spectrum. And and Twitter is trying to they're doing things where you can you get to see everything like blocking is going away yeah yeah uh so that you you will see the tweets of these other people with other viewpoints and they're trying to be more moderate not on one side or the other but by pushing it together and is that a response does elon see this sort of argument that we're making right now about the balkanization how the algorithm divides us and is he trying to say we actually have more in common than we think? And is that an experiment that's even going to work? And is Twitter even the right place for that? Okay, so um, which Elon are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, Elon Musk, the human being, or are we talking about Elon Musk, the businessman? Because Elon Musk, the human being, might believe we all need to sit down and talk. And I think most of us, regardless of where you're at politically, unless you're you know very extreme, Sitting down face to face, talking it out is the way to go. When you realize that your adversary is as a human being with feelings and families and their experiences, you know, inform their their current viewpoints, right? So we might have that Elon. But the other Elon is the businessman who's like, the more engagement we get, the more money I make. And God knows I gotta make money because I dropped forty four billion dollars on this piece of shit, right? I gotta make money. So and he's got that advertising exec he hired as the uh, the CEO. So my person, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is I think Twitter is removing the roadblocks, the barriers that that we have uh, put up in, amongst our tribes in order to get everybody to engage. And it might not all be good engagement, but it's still engagement, and it can still be bottled and marketed and sold to advertisers. Yeah, Twitter is PVP. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's going to be a free for all. And I think that that's mm -hmm. it's it's going to be good. I think from from a numbers perspective, it's going to be bad because I think it's actually going to drive people away. Now you can think what you want about block people are like oh blocking's for pussies, whatever. I'm like yeah, but in some cases that's the only reason that some people stay if they can curate their experience on social media on Twitter. It's like I'm not going to go on Twitter if I'm going to be screamed at all day, but if I can block these people out. And I can just go and focus on my interests and my tribe and whatever, they're gonna stay. You take that away, they're gonna go to like Discord or something where they can have a private conversation because they don't want to deal with all the other people that are gonna be in their face all the time. So I think it's I think it's gonna wind up being the Jerry Springer show, personally. So, I mean, that's, so that's how do we hand. solve this problem? Let's pull away from Twitter and, and Elon. And we were all sort of nodding our heads saying, Yeah, the algorithm drives us apart because it mm. caters to our interests and amplifies those interests, you know. To, to almost hyperbole, right? Uh, or mm -hmm. in, let's face it, in many cases, hyperbole. Um, how do we fix that? How do we fix social media in general to where we, we have, we focus not on catering to the individual and exacerbating their cultural view on media, the movies they like or the politics they like. How do we change that? to bring them together instead. And why isn't anybody talking about this more? I, I, I think we need to, and I know that like when you join a social media platform before the algorithm kicks in, they will give you like, what are your interests, right? I would say, <clears throat> I would say start with what's, 
what's trending. What are the most people talking about organically, not what's being rigged, but what are, what are all the common issues that everybody's talking about? And that is your start page. This is what everybody's talking about right now. They're all talking. This is the water cooler. This is the water cooler. This is what the majority of people are interested in right now, general audience, right? And then you can get more granular, like, okay, well, if you're not interested in lost, maybe you're interested in this other thing or whatever. And that's fine. That's like an optional thing. But I think, I think finding the, the most common ground and putting that in front of people versus like, oh, hey, we heard you're really angry about the Democrats or you're really angry about the Republicans. Here, let's show you some more accounts that are also angry about the Democrats or the Republicans. Just be like, no, here's just general news. Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on in the world today. Oh, look, here's some here's some nice pictures of, of kittens. You like kittens, right? Or you're more of a dog person. Okay. And then then just kind of work work out from there. Here Here's our common ground and then we're going to start branching off you know once you've gotten tired of that or rejected that or whatever but what they're doing is it, it, it's being trained to show you what is going to get the most engagement good or bad um so you're not really even you get to a point where you're not even being shown options like you get to a point where you interact with so many accounts that have the same point of view and the same I mean, interest. It's an echo chamber. It's, it's an echo chamber. chamber. You don't even get shown the other side of it. You don't get yeah. shown moderate yeah. takes. If, if you interact primarily with extreme voices or people that follow accounts with extreme voices or they only follow one side of the aisle, that's all you're going to be shown. And right. I think yeah. that is the problem because you lose right. you lose empathy or, or perspective for, for the other side or other points of view because mm -hmm. they're blocked out from your feed. That's That's mm -hmm. my opinion. I think, unfortunately, though, the, what everyone likes to talk about is controversy. Yeah, that drive that 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 drives the trend list, manipulated or not. Right. People are, gravitate towards a couple things, and one of them is train wrecks. So, um, when you get people talking about you know uh, uh, controversy, you're again you know dividing people. So, I actually think that I, I don't know if there's a solution for social media that would be profitable. Like, hey, you can't just have kumbaya stuff <laughs> trending. But but going back to that water cooler conversation, the one thing that we can do is media and pop culture can play a huge role in giving some giving people something outside of controversy that they really are into, right? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, and and this is why I think it's so we have a responsibility as movie makers, comic makers, and game makers to avoid politics. Yep. Because yep, exactly. we are the last bastion of commonality that can possibly bridge the gap. I like to talk about how games should be a watering hole. You know the theory yeah. of watering hole? Mm -hmm. uh, this could be a myth, but, you know, uh, in Africa, the lions and the tigers will sip water in from the same lake side by side with their prey, right? Yep. Um, that needs to happen we need to have these watering holes and unfortunately kumbaya stuff doesn't work but media does pop culture does people love that people engage with it so much and if we're going to get a lot of people engaging with it that's our opportunity to knit us mm -hmm. back together and the yep. last thing we should do is being exacerbating what the what the ai algorithms are doing on social media and driving people apart by including too much politics i think yep. it, it can be it can be you can skirt it. You can have interesting debates that show both sides. Like I always love seeing the twist where you think you're you have one political view, you're diehard against the other, but media very with a soft touch shows you the other side, right? Yeah. And then you go, hmm, yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. I I, I don't think we had this responsibility before. But I think we definitely have it now because I don't see any way out of it. I think it's got to come through all of our, you know, they say culture is downstream. What is it? Is it what, do I have it backwards? What's downstream from politics? Is pop it, culture. Pop yeah. culture is downstream yeah. from politics. Yeah. That, suddenly we're in this position where I think, oh, crap, if we don't do something to bring people together and give them those, the, a com, you know, something they agree on outside of their own identity and politics – uh, where else are they going to get it? And and uh, to me, as a creator, I'm starting to think at this level where it's like I I I wish I could create entertainment that uh, brings people together. That doesn't mean 
remove politics from games or anything like that but it means sort of like giving a soft-handed touch to it showing showing interesting questions and posing them and getting people to think differently um but primarily just to entertain them and have a great time so that they forget about all this other stuff and they can have a conversation together and now two people from vastly different political views can say oh but we both like this game and wasn't it great when this happened and that yeah, happened yeah. and then you laugh together and it softens everything so you know i don't know how to solve it for a social network which like as you pointed out from the business side of things pvp sells right pvp yes. gets engaged yes. and and yeah. and and Unfortunately, I, I see the YouTube algorithm driving creators to to polarize as well mm -hmm. and to cater to this this sort of like PvP mentality because that's what that's what they want that's to sell ads. That's what the algorithm is going to promote. So if you don't create can't content that way, they're not going to promote you as much. So who's left? Movies, comic books, games. Right. Right, exactly. And where we end up with social media and the algorithm is clearly showing, you know, the, the snake is eating its tail and it yep. will just continue to to give you that algorithm because it's based on business. It's based on money. So every single time that it was like, well, you you clicked on that ad. So keep going, keep going because we want more and more and more and more until, you yep. know, you're spending all of your money and time in their, in their tribe. And that's because that's what they want. They want, they, they want all of the, the money. And then if you have, uh, what you were talking about with, with the gaming and the culture and as creators, we're trying to create, uh, things that are just simply good stories, human stories. I think that's what it boils down to is what type of story are you telling in your game is it a human story something that is relatable across everyone you were neon you brought that up everybody's got families everybody's got there's yep. cultures and there's other things that everybody has so when you have a great piece of media it's something that any just about anybody should be able to observe this or interact with this media and then go wow you know, yeah, I get that. I get this part. I get that part. And we'll each get different parts because some of them are our parents and some of us aren't. And some of us are whatever it is, but we all get a piece of it. And I, the where I think we, we need to try to start drawing lines in the sand, unfortunately, is where it becomes this political problem where, you know, you play Hogwarts and we don't like... Hogwarts so you're a horrible person and then it, it drives this huge wedge you can't even talk about the fact is it a good game does it have good mechanics or how what are the graphics like we have no freaking clue all we talk about is that you know it was rowling and it was this and it was that blah 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 it turns into that the, the mess and we need to say we're not doing the mess like when we say no politics in tabletop like if you're here to play tabletop you're here to play tabletop yeah. we're not yeah. going to talk about you know, Bush, Clinton, I'm dating myself, Reagan. We're not, you know, we're I not really dating yourself. Yeah, we'll we're not talking four. about Kennedy. We're we'll not talking about the grassy four. knoll. We're talking about orcs, you know, that sort of thing. And But then in the game design, you can have politics in there. You can have, well, does the kingdom of dwarves hate the elves? Or does, you know, what's going on with this? Or what's going on with that? It's, so it's interesting. I, I really like getting into that is a very deep rabbit hole where you, you yeah. begin to realize. And, and But the point I was going to is uh, where I see where you're coming from, Grums, is that we as creators, maybe that's our agenda. Like, what what is our agenda? Because everything has an agenda. And people need to realize that. It, it all goes all the way back to broadcast TV, goes to books, everything. Every single thing has, a, there is an agenda, there's a, a reason to the story, there's something there. If you know, whether it's pure, you, you, even the purest, purest form of just entertainment, it's got something. There's some sort of narrative there. You know, there's a reason why Buster Keaton was jumping around the train, or you know, I'm trying to go back in time, or Odysseus. You know, he was trying to get home. There's a, there's a reason to those narratives. It's not just pure fluff. There's something in there that resonates with us, so that we want to tell, and and why we want to tell that story. So then it just becomes. You know, we're trying to reach the audience. We're trying to make money. You know, we're trying to juggle 15 balls and we're trying to do it in a way that uh, we go. Then when we go out onto social media, we just say, hey, I made this cool thing and I hope you all like it. You know, and, and it turns into, well, how many people of this do you have working for you? And how many people of that do you have working for you? You know what I mean? It, it can de-evolve into that. So where I'm going with all of this is 
there's a, what I see is there are some developers that are saying, no, we're not going to do this. We're mm -hmm. not going to politicize. We're not going to go down that road. Or you have others that jump full in, you know, Watsi, Wizards of the Coast, they jumped full in. They said, yeah. this is our target audience. This is what we're doing. Yep. And these are the people we're catering to and everybody else can pound sand. And that's fine. That's what they want to do. But now they're going to have to realize that they're all of their narrative, everything that they do is now going to be tainted by that particular slant and that particular, you know, that's what they're doing. And now they're in that camp. And so then somebody from the other camps, well, I'm not even going to do their, I'm not even going to bother with it, but we're just trying to make something good and fun, you know, that appeals to everyone, you know? And I think that's, that's sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I was I was seeing that. I think that that's a very admirable. That's where I'm going with that as well. I think it's very admirable that you'd want to do that as a game designer and, oh, and have that ideal and that goal of unity and how do we bring people together at the water cooler, you know? That's what not, we should be doing. I mean, yeah. and that's what we used to do. And it, mm -hmm. it, has, it has changed. I think just people, people in general are prone to wanting to to join a clan right they you know well, it's a bit of our hardwiring too. Gay, I mean, but yeah we're hardwired to join groups that's part of our identity and if you're not getting it from your society your culture whatever you're going to latch on to whatever and if it becomes your politics or your your gender or whatever the deal is you look at it and at the root of it it's always i belong here i belong to this group you mm -hmm. know so if we're taking away groups or identities for people to belong to they're going to get more and more granular until they find something and be like okay well i'm part of this group i guess because i'm not part of the bigger group i'm the outcast i'm part of this group over here and that's kind of how nerds you know and geeks found each other we were a lot of us were outcasts we didn't belong to the other groups so we we clanned up together and then we started playing D and video games and you know because we you always find your people you want to find your people you want to belong that's just that's mm -hmm. that's that's human nature and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe what needs to happen is, you know, we need to, I guess, cast a wider net, you know, so people don't feel so disenfranchised. So they don't go, you know, join in, join in these groups or whatever, or, or feeling disenfranchised or cut out of the bigger, the bigger pop culture. I don't mm -hmm. know. You focus no, yeah, on, and, and... you focus on entertainment. If you create incredible entertainment people will rally around it and and feel good and and you know we are the escapism from all the other stuff but we are also the common ground we can have we can have different types of people have those water cooler conversations and um you know um that that means focusing on entertaining first and you know and and getting getting the messages out of there uh or or if if that's something that you want to talk about, um, do it in a thoughtful way. Do it in mm -hmm. a thought-provoking way that gets the other side to empathize with that and to consider it. Um, and, and do it with a light touch, man. Do it with a light touch. Um, you know, focus on the entertainment and give people a reason to galvanize around it. And you can still have those mega hits. There are still, you know, things that cross boundaries and go super mainstream, um, that can appeal to a very wide audience and oddly enough it's not about you know uh, how how representative you are in your characters or anything else or your, your themes it's really more about what is the common entertainment that everyone can get behind and yeah. you alluded to humanity and this is what you know authors have talked about the human condition and philosophers have talked about the human conditions for so long we have problems in common and experiences in common as human beings that are universal Right. Uh, you know, we, we you know, we, we were born to biological parents. Uh, we uh, we live. We are born. We die. You know, the, we suffer. We have happiness. These are all common to all of us. These are things that we really should, you know, be leveraging more than ever to try to provide a balance to what's happening out there. Yeah, no. And I, I think that's a great I think that's a great thought to end this episode on. Um, and I mean, this, this has been, uh, this has been a, a fantastic conversation. Grums, thank you so much for coming on. I think, mm -hmm. I think we'll have to definitely do it again because there are so many rabbit holes that we could go down. 
uh, we could get 10 hours, you know, out of, out of this, uh, conversation, but, uh, I don't have 10 hours today and I, I don't think neither, neither of you do either, but thank you, uh, so much again, Grums for coming on Michael, my uh, pleasure for coming on, uh, definitely guys. I want to give a real quick, uh, shout out to where people can find you online. Uh, Grums, why don't you go ahead first? Yeah. Uh, you can, you can find me on Twitter is my medium. Uh, you can find me at Grums on Twitter and that's the best place to find me. Uh, if you're interested in in what we're doing with the game and what I'm trying to do with multiplayer to help bring people together in an entertainment experience, you can go to our Discord server. It's just Ember, E-M dash eight E-R. Uh, it's pronounced Ember, but it's spelled with an eight. And uh, people there are real friendly. They'll, they'll tell you about the game if you're interested in that. But those are the two places I hang out. I hang out on Discord and I hang out on Twitter. Awesome. Awesome. Michael, Michael Hovermail, where can people find you? Uh, well, primarily, I have a very tiny YouTube channel, uh, Graph Paper Architect, but I really have uh, retracted from social media, so I'm not on Twitters, Facebooks, any of that sort of situation at all. Uh, it's going to be very minimal for me. So finding me and contacting me, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll probably check it in a month. Um, so really, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but it's I'm going through a bit of a, you know, interesting time to just reconsider and refocus exactly what i want to be doing on social media and why and give it more of a specific purpose because i, I don't have any interest in scrolling you know it doesn't yeah. doesn't appeal to me anymore but yeah so that's where i'm at uh you can find me there and uh yeah i'm also on discord i like discord because it is it's a focused media i can go in there and you'll i'll be in ember so i'll see you in there grums Awesome. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, guys, thank you so much. Again, thank you, uh, everyone listening to this podcast. Please subscribe wherever you find it. If you found it on uh, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, uh, wherever else they blast this out to. This is d on Clownfish TV. There are more Clownfish TV videos on YouTube and Rumble as well. Uh, thank you so much, guys. We'll talk again.